You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is May 21st, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Our presenter is Dr. Leonard Billery. He's a professor of medicine at the Rutgers University Center for Environmental Prediction in Piscataway, New Jersey. To get started again. Um, we're now joined by Dr. Len, Leonard Billery. Dr. Billery um, is going to talk with us about complementary and alternative medicine. He's a prof- professor at Rutgers University Center for Environmental Prediction, and he's an affiliate member of the NIEHS Center for Environmental Health Sciences uh, at the Environment and Occupational Health Sciences Institute at Rutgers University, the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey. Uh, Dr. Billery is an uh, international expert on uh, allergic conjunctivitis and ocular disease, but he's also an expert on complementary and alternative medicine. And I'm kind of curious to know why that, that combination of, of interest, but uh, maybe uh, he'll be happy to join us. Uh, welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Billery. Hello there, sir. Can you see my... I'm trying to get my screen going for you guys. Can you see it now? I'm going to make you a presenter. So. Just click show my screen and, and we'll be I'm able to... I'm going to talk about complementary medicine and it's useful as an adjunctive therapy. Your question uh, uh, is to the ideas that are supposed to be... Uh, where did it go? There it is. Financial disclosures. Um, it, what I plan to do is provide an overview of the NIH, the N- National Center of Complementary and Alternative Medicine, uh, which is NCAM for the NIH. It's actually a center uh, they appreciate the impact of CAM use in the United States and specifically address it in regards to allergies where we can understand some potential uses. But more importantly, uh, in our subspecialty, it's adverse effects as well because uh, people can be allergic to stuff or give you adverse effects from these that are pseudo-allergic. Um, and to go over these for and their impact, and many people forget that vitamins, which you should be questioning all the time, uh, in your patients for what they're using on this regards uh, between vitamins, herbs. You should make that part of your routine assessment because they do have an impact on allergic and immunological disorders, whether it's pharmacokinetics or actually in causing or maybe uh, potentially even in treating uh, allergic or immunological disorders. Being that this has to be a CME component, disclosures are here that um, I'm variety, consult variety companies, performing grants for a variety of companies, studies, uh, or the benefit of the CME component for the Cola University uh, project that Jay has developed. Now, how I got involved, uh, be quite honestly, is that I saw so many patients over time, a number about 15, 20 years ago, Tiger Bomb was one that triggered my, my specific situation where a person came in with severe dermatitis and it looked like it was contact, uh, and it was associated with the use of Tiger Bomb for the treatment of allergies and asthma. And that was, you know, an, an opening of my mind. I said, what, you know, what's going on here? And quite honestly, people are using a lot of external materials. And it was at this time, and what we go over, um, there's been increasing appreciation of, the, of this. Some of the background that you need to know it's just the laws or what, how did the herbals and variety of complementary medicine or these alternative interventions come to being uh, and into the legal framework? And here's a Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, known as DSHA, of which they classified vitamins, and herbs, minerals, amino acids as, but they excluded the tobacco, meaning including cigars, even though tobacco is an herb, uh, and it contains a high content, but it got excluded from this uh, subset of the DSHA Act. Uh, it permitted medical claims of such dietary supplements other than prevention of pure disease. You cannot mention, well, I'm taking this, this herb or this item for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. You can't mention a treatment of a specific condition. You can say, for the health of my joints. And sure enough, as one travels, as Jay does and many of you will do over your years, 
you will, uh, I, I was amazed, I traveled to Texas, I give a lecture, and you, know, you stay overnight, and you open up a TV uh, in the hotel room, and you see these ads, over ads, over ads, over ads, about enhancements <laughs> of X, Y, and Z for this or that, and it's pretty impressive uh, that they're making direct claims, and actually many of them are probably illegal based upon the Disha Act. And there has been an increasing crackdown on some of these issues. The production and distribution, interesting enough, for the dietary supplements are not subject to regulatory screening used in the pharmaceutical industry. When you're talking about a pharmaceutical drug, you're talking about a pure entity. When you're talking about a dietary supplement, you're talking about a, basically a food. And foods, you're permitted uh, within certain regards to have uh, a certain contamination of a certain percentage and consider, be considered zero. And that's why in our peanut allergic patients, even though the product may not read, you know, that peanuts are in are part of the ingredient or there's certain proteins, it still may be present, except that recently even lawsuits have generated that, well, if you use it on the line, the same food line, you should say that it's been used, even though they don't have to report it, uh, meaning they don't have to make it as part of the ingredients uh, set in these foodstuffs. So again, this is where that basis is called the Disha Act. And if you look at back in history and before in July of 1992, U.S. Congress actually created an office before it became a center. And it allocated $2 million to this center uh, to investigate and, and evaluate promising unconventional medical practices. And there was an initial appointment of Dr. Groff. Uh, to this, and that budget has gone from two million to several hundred million today. And I, at the beginning, this was under a very cross examination by a variety of other institutes because they were upset that even two million dollars into this area would, is a waste of money, and that they could be working more on cancer or the national lung you know, on asthma or something to that effect, or at that time HIV, AIDS. What they did do well, when the office got it was created there in October of 1991, was that they created a, an assessment, a crude assessment of trying to put together a ad hoc advisory panel where they did an uh, under the office. It was non-governmental. It was specifically a workshop and was designed to facilitate some type of categorization of CAM, of complementary and alternative therapies for discussion and study only. It wasn't to create a definitive one and it was not FDA approved, but, and as this reference down below, I actually had an NIH grant based upon from the NCAM to introduce the concept of CAM into allergy and immunology and educational basis. And we did so actually with uh, a meeting of the, of the, it was in San Antonio, and it was actually the academy. Uh, it was an academy meeting. Uh, was it Academy or College? I can't even remember anymore. Um, and it was one of our annual meetings. I'm trying to remember which one it was San Antonio. Jay, do you remember? I can't remember this anymore. Doesn't it's matter. Pretty, pretty sad. Uh, but the point is, with one of our annual meetings, and I think I'm, I'm now I'm pretty sure it was the college. Uh, it was American College of Allergy and Asthma Immunology. It was the meeting that actually. Um, Oh, he had a he had, he had a myocardial infarction. Or the, the president of the academy had he was visiting. He was actually there, and he actually had to stay stay over um, at that time. And um, here we go. So these were the defined CAM domains: biologically based systems. We had a manipulative and body based mind body medicine alternative. That was the uh, west you know Western versus non Western techniques and energy therapies were the classifications that came out of this group uh, of this meeting. So, and in that, that next regard, what are the issues that, what are we missing uh, is an important perspective. There is a mind, what I call mind and body is psychosomatic and somatopsychic is a component of medicine that we are constantly working with, but people believe in certain things and that's what I call the, um, you know, in a way it supports in for example, allergic responses or clinical studies, you will see 20 to 30 percent in the placebo group. I mean, believe that something is working, it's going to have an effect. Um, and that is the belief. And that's just a part that many people just can't understand or measure because we can't 
measure body pharmacology, and even when it, you know the mind was an area in the beginning that was very aloof. Uh, if it wasn't for psychoanalysis and Freud, uh, I mean, even this had was questionable as how do you quantify it, it uh, in in being real and putting these two domains together, there clearly is a third domain where actually the spirit or belief is very, very important in the assessment. And that's what really people trust you as a physician uh, in regarding to their psychosomatic components or somatopsychic and believing. And that alone has its own therapeutic benefit. There is such a thing as a broken heart. Uh, I always measure, you know, question is that, yeah, with mind and body, you can measure these things. However, um, can you measure your belief? Well, I always make it a comment, can you measure love? I mean, how much do you love your child? How much do you love your mother? There's no measuring stick, but it does truly is immeasurable, but it, is, it, is, it does exist. So there are things, and it's hard to go through those items and through the scientific principles of uh, investigation, of quantification, and actually performance of statistics and making statistical significance. When you do all uh, the assessment of classification, now that we have some crude classification uh, done by the NIH, we're now looking at the, what's popular. Well, biologically based, uh, based therapies, about 20% when you exclude prayer. Mind-body, 17%. Manipulative, uh, 10%. Alternate medical symptoms and energy therapies are very low fruits of the tree. The United States, Nisha, again, uh, coming back to it again, remember it's exclusive of tobacco. And that, that had totally been due to uh, lobbying based upon the tobacco industry because they didn't want to come under the regulation. It wanted to have an, ex, uh, an exception to that process. When you look at the World Health Organization, they designated in November of 1996 uh, the quote unquote collaborating center in traditional medicine. So it became a world um, organization, a world health organization started to recognize this issue. And it went from 1990, within five years, the U.S. had their office. The World Health Organization now designated itself a collaborating center. So it's starting to evolve only in the past 20 years. So put that in perspective historically, because if you look at the use of alternative health care, Worldwide, what we do provide for our patients in the clinic is delivered by conventional biomedical oriented practitioners, meaning that's us. That's only 10 to 30 percent of human health care, whereas the remaining 70 to 90 percent, depending on what numbers you want to believe, makes no difference, is really self-care according to full principles for to care given in an organized health care system based on an alternative tradition or to some type of form of practice. So let's talk about where these people are, who's using what. Populations using traditional medicine for primary health care. Well, this is traditional medicine. Uh, again, Ethiopia using traditional for primary health care, probably developed countries who have complementary alternative medicines. You can also you look at the concept here. Um, well, that's actually uh, the scenario here. Probably use traditional medicine for primary. Uh, and populations developed who have used complementary, meaning we find that people are using, even in developed countries, complementary, what we call this complementary and alternative medicine. Uh, when you say using traditional medicine, primary health care, this is what they want to do, but it, the, it's universally uh, almost a, another system totally. Well, what is the prevalence in the United States? This is, I, this is a classic paper. It may show up on boards. It's from Eisenberg, New England Journal, 1993. And it's a, it gives you a, a great snapshot based upon a phone survey and, he, and it was extrapolation. Well, they took the databases and uh, also assessed 425 versus 388 million visits. Well, which one is which? Well, 425 million was actually the alternative versus 388 where it was the primary care uh, visit. So there were more people visiting the alternative or complementary treatment centers than they were coming to see you in your office. And you have to know, in 1990, insurances were not covering unconventional uh, medicine. So people were taking out of their pocket to see these physicians or these health care providers. The cost projected at $14 billion. It was out of pocket 
herbalism was huge. We're 1,800 herbal products. It was growing at a rate of 25% per year, and the sales were in, in excess of $1.5 billion. Global sales was 10 times that. When you talked about a little bit more detail, a third reported using one or more unconventional therapies in this phone survey. A third had an average of 19 visits in a single year. Now, that, that could be to a chiropractor. It could be to a reflexologist. It could be a massage therapist. Whereas two, more than two-thirds did not report any use, meaning people were quiet about it. It was high. Now, this is an interest. This, again, a cross-section. The highest use was seen in Caucasians. Ages 25 to 49, people who were employed, working, had higher education, graduated from college, and a higher income level. There was an interesting cross-section. That um, may not come out. We'll, we'll show you a little bit different numbers or a perspective when it comes to other items. But this was the original one that came out, and this was also seen in an article in the American Journal of Managed Care. And it was for predominantly chronic, non-lightly threatening conditions, meaning lower back pain, uh, allergies, things that were chronic and interfered with the quality of life that just didn't want to go away. Now, herbal medicines were growing. And how fast were they growing? Well, we just mentioned before, it was 15 billion, and here's another cross section that was done in 2000. 60 billion world market for herbal medicine, including raw materials. This is expanding the numbers, and it gives you a sense of where. Well, Western Europe takes up a clear, clear 25 uh, percent. China another 25 percent, and there's a half is just a wrap distributed around the world. With the U.S. falling, you know, is behind in those items, but clearly. There is a large amount to give you a perspective of where things are. Western Europe is a heavy user of complementary and alternative medicine, equivalent to China, which you would think would be half the world or uh, in that regards. Now, the U.S. Medicinals, um, 1930. This is the evolution of what we call medicine in the United States. The Materia Medica was pre-pharmacology. Before we had the pharmacology, we actually went, people would take an herb, crush it, you needed a tincture, a concoction, uh, and it had a lack of standardization. It literally was based upon what you, you know, could collect in the fields. And that's really what the Materia Medica was, which was pre the pharmacological era. In 1950, natural products being removed from the medical venue due to misuse in the United States, and then in 1980, there's a research in the therapeutic medicinal botanicals with enhanced standardization because it became a more of a quality issue. And then, as I stated, because of that, within the 10 to 15 years, there was a federal regulation called DSHA to, to monitor and to try to create a regulatory component for this uh, medicinal botanicals. Now, why did this all come about? It's like the, the evolution of the FDA in general is that the if you remember the Wizard of Oz, there is the opening scene of the wizard and or someone who is in the memory of the dream as the wizard. And what is he doing? He's selling medicinals out of his little uh, uh, caboose, uh, being wagon, and he's selling in, in the backfields of Kansas. Uh, well, what happened in Tennessee was that a very similar situation occurred, and someone was selling an elixir uh, that was tainted uh, with uh, with toxins or specifically of metals. And in that regards, there was an outbreak of a to toxic impact from this. And the, F and the federal government stepped in and said, well, we can't have people selling this stuff with that, without having some type of control of quality. And the first level of the FDA was primum non sincere. You can do no harm. It didn't have to work, but you just couldn't sell something that was a poison or a toxin. And then we got into the thing, no, now we have to have it work at stage two. That's the, and then what we're entering the stage three of the FDA is that not only does it have to work, but we're going to start saying, does it work better? Does it, is it cheaper uh, in performing the same job? So the basic tenets of the Materia Medica was pharmacology versus pharmacognosing, identifying the plants, and where properties of drugs, drug, su drug substances, or potential drugs, uh, of natural origin, as well as the search for new drugs from natural sources. This is where, like I say, going out into the fields. The materia medica effectiveness of, now this is an important feature, the effectiveness of the heterogeneous botanical is greater than the sum of its components, meaning 
if you tried to extract what you thought was the active agent, you would find that it didn't work. You know, it wouldn't work as well. And then when you added the other portions of the extracts back to it, it still didn't work as well as the original botanical. So you know, that's what it says. The extracts of botanicals, when reconstituted in the original rate, did not have the same activity. It was actually less than the original um, botanical that was being made. Now, the reasons for alternative treatment use in children. This is a, a study done in 1995. The number one reason was word of mouth. Why do people use it or give it to their children? A third said it's just knowing it works. Others, a 20%, mentioned that we were afraid of the stuff that we give. They're afraid of the side effects of the medications that they were getting in a doctor's office. And obviously, as we mentioned before, the chronic medical problem, a persistent problem, lower back pain or allergies or colds, since it's something that just doesn't go away, asthma, they would try the quote-unquote treatment of alternative intervention. One out of 10 people in your clinic, one out of 10 people that will be in your office, will be dissatisfied with you working with them unless you communicate well with them. And this is uh, a fact that's over and over again that you need to put into place because that is one of the reasons that drives them from quote unquote standard of care to complementary or alternative medicine care. And clearly desire for more personalized attention. One out of ten, that dissatisfaction, this is an overlay, is that they're not happy with what you know uh, with the way we allocate time for them. And the alternative practitioners give a lot of time. They handhold a lot and they are very personable and they get a lot of headlines, so to speak. Uh, and mileage meeting with their patients and moving with them. So make that, you know, I always make a comment, uh, there is a clear study that shows if you shake the hands of pressed flesh uh, with your patients, you decrease your legal or negative or negative or legal interaction, which would be a more of a negative one, by almost half. That's an, an, a very incredible number that just going in, when you go into that exam room, say hello, shake their hands, say, it's personal. And that's what people are looking for. Now, what are people using in the PZR? Well, this is a survey done in Atlanta uh, of what, whether they uh, are using a non-FDA regulated herbal products and whether they had any knowledge about it. Uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, we had 142 out of 153 individuals participated. The average age of the ch child was five, uh, with uh, over nine, almost 90 percent of the parents having college education. And in the past year, 45% of them had used some herbal, some herbs, had given their child an herb. So half gave one, and 25, 27% gave three items. What were the most common ones? Aloe plant juice, echinacea, or sweet oil, ephedra, and albuterol in asthma. And what's, remember, and people will remember what ephedra is. Ephedra is mawang, it's a plant. But it's the plant that we derive ephedrine from, and it does work for asthma, but it's, it's a, not a selective uh, beta. It's, it's as good as epi, almost as good as epinephrine. Unusual products that were used. Now listen to this: turpentine, pine needles, cow chips. With th three quarters of them were uncertain of side effects, but they were willing to use it. And only half of them, less than half, actually discussed these items with the primary care doctor. When you look at the Hispanic use versus the Caucasian use and a border population, El Paso, meaning where are you in the country makes a difference. El Paso, Texas has a lot more Hispanics, and 42% prospectively use herbals for asthma, and they consist of oregano, chamomile, garlic, eucalyptus, and lime. And this was because that's what their parents used when they lived in Mexico or came over um, to work in the United States. Looking at CAM and its general use in the literature, uh, we did a study trying to quickly do an analysis of, if you look at immunology uh, articles and the use of CAM, asthma, allergy, autoimmune, hypertension, these were the terms that were searched. Immunological aspects were, were taking off into citations that in 1990s were percolating at 100 and almost nil for the others, and it started to double and triple over a period of 15 to 20 years. And this has continued to grow uh, when you look at these concepts of entities that it is a process that is constantly in the literature and growing. 
Now, is when you say it's growing, what is it growing from, or where is it growing? Um, the scenario is uh, prayer is still number one. Prayer for self, prayer from others, prayer groups. Look at the top five. There's four out of the top five are all prayer. People actually have a belief. Remember the word belief, this, you know, the mind and body, but belief in trying to help others. They consider that an interaction trying to help. Natural products was, was really, after prayer, the, the next item. And then came chiropractic. And then we got the breathing meditation where we got massage, therapy, yoga, diet based. If you look all the way down, and it, can, it ranges up to almost two thirds of the population, but prayer outraged all, you know, did more than all. And if you add the other, all the prayers together, it really takes on a very high population. Whereas herbals are almost equivalent to the prayer group. Now, when you look at the, what herbs, since we said prayer, if you take the top five and four out of the five are prayer, you take those out, you look at the herbal use, what was the most common herbal use in 2002? Echinacea. Now, echinacea is an, an agent known as a cone flower, and it is used for upper respiratory tract uh, colds, uh, inflammatory process, and therefore people started using it for allergies, for health of the upper respiratory tract versus saying treatment of colds and allergies. It wouldn't, it doesn't, it's not supposed to say that, but it, it's for the health. What then came up in the year, uh, what we call 2010, echinacea was a fad and it fell down, it has fallen from the number one slot, whereas ginkgo uh, has moved up to that number one. But again, everything is into, is fadism, uh, like fish oils is growing tremendously. And now you have a prescription fish oil, and that's a point that I want to make from this slide and a variety of others. If you look here, fish oil is in the middle. and it is one of the agents, but now fish oils has become an FDA approved product uh, known as Lavaza for the lowering of triglycerides, and it's known to work. So things that were uh, involved as uh, not a complementary, and, and I don't want to use the word alternative. Alternative means you don't use anything else, and that is rare. That is less than 1%, less than a half percent. It, it's a fraction of, of, of their use in this country, uh, but nonetheless, that like fish oils, they are now part of standard of care in cardiovascular practices for lowering of lipids. And we're going to talk about others. So we're going to start talking about integrative medicine as evidence becomes more substantiated to justify their use uh, as we look to, to gain uh, that type of information. Can use uh, by age, there is a difference, as we mentioned by the uh, the Eisenberg study in the New England Journal of Medicine, but this study was done, quote unquote, by Barnes, uh, and this is a 2007 where she did the survey and published in 2008, and she also found that you know as you get older, uh, the ages from 18, you're, you're about out of college, to you get a peaking at 50 to 59, uh, you start using a lot more pills and herbals, and believe in a lot of things uh, over time. But it just as an observation, this is CAM used by age. When the most common use in by age in 2007, again, natural products lead the way when you take out the prayer component as well. The top herbs, well, as I said it before, in 2002, Echinacea led the way, uh, and there was garlic. Now, a board question for garlic, for example, is that garlic actually does, has anticoagulant ability, and as such, one needs this continued garlic for two weeks before um, going for surgery or, or anything because it can prolong the prothrombin time by almost two to three times if it was taken at high enough dosages. The 10 most common natural products in 2007, and take a look, fish oil starts to lead the way and again fish oil that led the way has now <laughs> led uh, to an FDA product because people are willing to invest the the pharmaceutical company was willing to invest in something that was so big fad, whether or not it had evidence, and sure enough, there was evidence, but they needed to standardize it so they can make it a prescription. And that's what Lavaza has come out. And by the way, I'm mentioning a product. I have no personal interest in it. I have no, I'm not even consulting for the company, but um, it, I'm mentioning it as a specific, as an example of where things may have been complementary and now becomes integrated into the standard of care uh, and will be into guidelines as, as it, with time we'll be more and more involved with this. And again, I'll be showing some more on this topic, whereas echinacea 
has dropped to 20%, but glucosamine, which is used for a variety of arthritis, um, and quote unquote, uh, flaxseed oils, many patients with ocular surface disorders uh, that I see, I learned, I, I, you know, the, the number of people with taking flaxseed is, is quite high because no, many ophthalmologists use a variety of vitamins. Uh, there's something called Occuvite by Bausch and Lomb. Uh, it contains lutein and uh, a variety of other agents. And uh, again, we'll mention a little bit more of those a little bit down the road here. Okay, can use in children. Again, take a look. Natural products, but there's a little bit more chiropractic. They're willing, mothers are willing to take it. But we're talking about only 4% is very, you know, as a, uh, on the top of the uh, item here. A survey done by, uh, with myself, Renata Angler, Bill Silvers, and part of the committee, we have a committee of complementary and alternative medicine. Anybody interested, please uh, consider joining, uh, whether it's the academy or college or both. They work together hand in hand to, to do this. Um, we surveyed the allergists and find out what they're using and then compared it to what Barnes had said in her studies at the CDC. And obviously, uh, the, what was interesting is that the universe of the people using is in green and the botanicals are more commonly used. But where is it that allergists use more than what the general population? And if you look, it's very interesting, special diet therapies, that's our food allergy. Restrictive diets where we give people diets. But when it comes to the general, we're, we're right in line. Uh, maybe massage, prayer, you know, my, my joke there is that uh, perhaps we're not praying enough. Uh, in general, uh, that uh, maybe we should start invoking some more of that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, people are using a lot more chiropractic out, out there than we are uh, recommending or, or assessing, or even for ourselves. Prayer is being used and herbal, but clearly special diet therapies is where we actually exceed what was the general norm. I put this evidence pyramid because this is what we as a group uh, use for assessing whether something should change our opinion uh, into developing a integration with our clinical practices. And we, we start with lab and animal research, we get the case reports, we get case controls, cohort studies, randomized control studies, and then randomized control, double-blinded, and then we get a meta-analysis system, re systematic reviews of those underneath here to see if there's a trend toward a direction for considerable integration. And as such, in the world as we know it, there are a variety of herbals that have actually started to transfer from quote unquote um, complementary, uh, or I will say in the general world it was their standard of care where Pacific yew tree we have for breast cancer was the origin of taxol. Tisogenine is a Mexican yam for birth control. Then blastine and bincristine came from periwig or Madagascar. Strychnine was a nerve stimulant out of India. Albane, which is a heart stimulant, was out of West Africa. Curare, quinine, cocaine, all out of South America, as uh, Indians have used these for many years for treatments of a variety of conditions. And from that herbal components, we have then utilized them and integrated into our standard of care. One of those common standard integration standard of care that is coming up now is probiotics. And the proposed use, uses of this is for infectious diarrhea, inflammatory bowel disease, and in fact, there is an approved product for inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel disease of probiotics, and I'll mention that in particular. Again, I'm not a consult, I'm a, you know, I have no shares. I, I make it easy because there are very few items like Lovaza or what we call cultural probiotics that are specifically approved uh, by the FDA with clear studies that show some impact in conditions. And as such, they are, are, are on your armamentarium. How you use them, again, no one's done some clear-cut studies for allergies per se, but it's, um, well, we'll mention about some of the studies they've done. But nonetheless, there are a variety of these probiotics. And probiotics is nothing more than a uh, life, a, a bacterial or fungal, in this case, lactobacillus type of, of uh, based items where they are pro the implant or pro the development uh, in the gastrointestinal tract to induce changes of the immune system. And as you see, there's a variety of things that have been studied. Uh, specifically, in rheumatoid, last two are rheumatoid arthritis and atopic diseases with rheumatoid arthritis actually having, again, uh, an approval of these probiotics. 
The probiotics in atopic disease, while well, there have been studies with, with LGG, which is lactobacillus, GG is the type, where they take 10 billion uh, colony forming units were given to the mother with a family history of a first degree relative with some type of atopic disorder. And the mother for two and a weeks before delivered an infant of lack for, the, for six months. So they, they took it before they were born and for six months afterwards the mothers were taking it. And they measured what, how much atopic disorders were noticed in the infants at the end of two years. And there was a dramatic reduction it was by half. And this is, again, another one uh, for your follow-up. Relative risk of atopic dermatitis um, eczema was also decreased. Now, the quote-unquote, when you look at the analysis overall, all the studies when they try to figure out and standardize, we try to do a meta-analysis on this. And, yeah, there's a trend. There's a signal that probiotics may be helpful in atopic dermatitis. However, sitting with the World Allergy Organization and meeting with the World Health recently, uh, we have come to the conclusion that there still need more, better studies that better define when and where before we say definitively that it has an impact because there are a variety of variables that re really require uh, their concern or their impact. The question is, is there a negative impact that is other than cost? Probably not. But still there is a trend and it seems to be positive, but the like World Allergy Organization, as I said in the committee, we're holding off on reserving and said we would like to have more structured studies because we can't tell you when to take it, who, you know, who should take it, whether there's a subset, there's a variety of components that needs to be addressed. But it does upregulate TH2 cytokines in vitro, it downregulates TH1 in vitro, and it inhibits interferon gamma by T cells and transcription factors, uh, and induces Tregs. The other items that people forget are antioxidants, which are becoming very hot. Is it a fad or is it real? Well, one of the agents are, is such as quercetin, and has been studied on mast cells, where the inhibitory effect of quercetin on mast cell secretion. And interesting enough, there's a direct uh, correlation, uh, where mast cells and meteors can be the targets of dietary supplements. And interesting enough, this was an article um, that people may not realize, but that textbook that you use called Middleton, Textbook of Allergy. Well, Elliot Middleton actually was a big supporter of quercetin as an antioxidant and its effect on allergies. He wrote several grants for the NIH, never being funded while at the uh, university, uh, at the State University of New York in Buffalo, where at the Buffalo, uh, where he was at the uh, Buffalo General Hospital, and he actually did some studies and uh, people have picked up from that afterwards in the more modern era with this and actually found that quote-unquote quercetin does have an effect on mast cells, which is very old. it's an older literature, but quercetin also inhibited interleukin-1 induced IL secretion. And this is a, you know, a paper that was recently um, shown to reflect that same effect. So it does have this quote-unquote this transcription factor or antioxidant in fact is known and is, is, does exist. The question is how clinically relevant are they? Well, if you look at some of the other things that you need to uh, put together in this overall, in this one hour, this uh, quick display overview of complementary and comparable medicine, you know, the vitamins can take a role, uh, vitamin A, vitamin E, even zinc, and there are some studies that show uh, some effect and more so uh, on immune function or anti-inflammatory function. And as such, specifically plasma levels of vitamin A with common variable immunodeficiency. It was very fascinating to look at some of the impact of this, and there's been more recent articles, for example, on vitamin D uh, as well. And it's where with asthma and allergic disorders, and there appears to be a correlation. Again, what drew me to this area, again, was a review that I did on vitamin C as an antioxidant or an impact on allergies, and I wanted to look at others, and did a, a simple review slash meta-analysis, though the studies for meta-analysis were never published because there were not enough studies that I could standardize between the authors to provide that detailed uh, com com component to the review. But the review gave a trend or a signal of potential that antioxidants may be playing a role. But in plasma levels of vitamin A in quote unquote variable immunodeficiency. Well, it's fascinating to look at quote unquote 
the levels are lower in patients who have CBI and it may have an effect on the development of interferon based uh, production in spleen cells. And if you look, quote unquote, the effect of vitamin supplementation in com combined variable, this was a study that uh, had been evaluated in India as well, and because there was a higher prevalence of vitamin A uh, deficiencies noted there. Here we have six uh, CBI patients with the lowest vitamin A combined with normal absorption were included in an open non-placebo control where they were got a vitamin A substitution study. They either received vitamin A over a period of six months, and they looked at their PHA stimulated peripheral blood mononuclear cells, as well as anti-CD40, and over that period of six months, their stimulation indices improved, as well as their CD4 stimulated IG production. Uh, so there was a change just by, quote unquote, supplementing them with vitamin A. Some clinical L evidence, okay? So this is a signal, and, and it's something to look at, but do, you have to be worried about one thing is that how much do you need, because vitamins A, D, E, and K are fat soluble and you can get toxic from these because you can overdose, whereas vitamin C is water soluble and you actually don't, you can take as much as you want and, and you can buy the most expensive brands and what happens to it is that you just simply urinate it out. It is just excreted with, um, in that regards. Now, David Pedden was working on the evaluation of vitamin E. Now, the term that you need to know is the different portions of vitamin E. There's alpha and there's gamma tocopherol are the components of vitamin E. And he looked at the, whether alpha or gamma made a difference. And it, it was interesting that alpha had no effect. So you need to know that, that the alpha tocopherols that are out there have had no effect on anti, uh, as an anti-inflammatory, whereas gamma did show in pulmonary nasal tissue in animal models and, uh, and this is basically animal models that were sacrificed and they were looked for the stimulus of the quote unquote uh, oval albumin, an allergic, uh, basically an allergy model, who were given either corn oil or gamma tocopherol and then you, you sacrifice them over time and you look at quote unquote the lung, the nose, the maxillary sinus, or the nasal lacrimal duct. And there was clear differences of the inflammatory response as measured by eosinophils into these tissues if you took gamma to coprol. So that, and this is uh, something that David Pedden uh, had actually was funded by the MCAM to perform over five, and he had an incredible group of individuals uh, that were from uh, Oakland, California, uh, from Michigan State, and he's down at the University of North Carolina, and he was coordinating this, and he was going to do human studies based upon the preliminary uh, items, and he actually has some evidence or that trended also that gamma to copper was better for anti-inflammatory than others. Coming back to the U.S. medicinals, the pharmaceutical industry is defined by chemically active structures. We talk about the purity. You can't have impure components. You can't have a, an Allegra or whatever, any product with some other contaminant, whereas a biological is defined by its production process. Uh, process. What agents do we use in allergenology that's defined by a process? Gamma globulin. If gamma globulin is done by a single step, uh, A or B temperature change or something, it no longer can be used. And that's classically the most common ones that we all use when we're in our training with red blood cells, transfusions. If they were not transported and were maintained in a certain temperature, it's a process that maintains their quote unquote approval. If they're not in that maintain the process, they cannot be used. And the botanicals are free floating, but yet there's a discussion to propose a hybrid of both, which is defined by a process with some type of activity. Now I did mention before that the combination of four plants creates a powerful synergy for maximum. This is an actual study of cancer effect, the anti-tumor effect of a certain plant uh, based product. And then what they did was take out the variety of different components uh, and try to challenge them in, quote unquote, the four plants, the different components, and you would notice that we can see effectiveness of, of the parts. So basically, all components, these fractions, needed to work together to get the effect of this anti-tumor effect in this in vitro model. So this just you know, brings back to you that plant search is amazing. It's going to go on for many years, and Sometimes we discover something and we isolate it, but that it's isolated, being in isolation 
is sometimes not the best drug. It needs to be worked because many uh, of our pharmacological systems require concatenate, meaning there are stepwise, and if you hit multiple steps at once, you get a better outcome. And sure enough, when you look at the approach that we're talking about in this kind of a multiple step, we need to capture not only the chemical from a fingerprint, but we're looking for some type of activity, what bioresponse. So these two items will sometimes come down the road of being uh, the basis. What you do have to remember is that these things are not necessarily all beneficial. They're, they have some physiological activities, but they can have toxicity. Mawang can inhibit mast cell granulation. It has sympathetic activity. It's wonderful. Uh, it's a great decongestant, but you can have a sudden death because there's no standardization. Acute hepatitis. Uh, there's a variety of other items which I'm not going to go into, but they have been shown in vitro effects, and they think they note uh, some studies have clearly have noted uh, in, uh, <coughs> in humans or in animal models a clinical effect. But again, many of these are small case studies or limited, not controlled. They're not the, they're not the full pyramid of evaluation. Peppermint, interesting enough, uh, does decrease inflammation and stabilizes uh, mast cells. And there's more stuff that's coming out with that, for example, of like a nasal solution mixed with some peppermint, which I'll mention at the end. The uh, other items now, for example, urticaria dioca is a nettle and actually contains histamine. Uh, so therefore, it, as a contagion, you can actually cause, and it's commonly used in the homeopathic treatment, but if you touch a nettle, you can get contact urticaria directly from the injection of, uh, of the histamine. The onion, known as allium sepa, has quercetin. So, I mean, a variety, and I don't... Jay may remember the days of the tourist ceremonial that we used to be, when we were being lectured about how asthma was treated, people used to smoke a cigarette, and it was ginseng weed, which actually had in it atropine, it was an atropine light cigarette, uh, which caused bronchodilatation, but it had its side effects, uh, urinary retention, hallucinations, ataxia. So it, everything is so easy. When we try to bring that product to market, when you try to bring something, you, you get initial bioactive sample processing, we talked about material medically, it takes an incredible amount of material to get to your final development. And many times, because as I told you before, you may need, we may have extracted one or two items that aren't, when we separated them, they don't work as well as when they work together. So there's a problem in the production line at times and looking to develop the best products. So the procedure for developing a new chemical drug, we know it's clinical research. It's at least five years, large-scale animal testing. Go phase one, 1 1.5 years. Phase two can be two years. Phase three, three. Another. So we're down to 12 years, and then review by the FDA can be up to one and a half years, and ongoing. In general, it takes about 13 years for almost $100 million to bring a specific product that's FDA of a new chemical drug to market, just to give you perspective. Whereas many of these herbals are grandfathered in and they can just make claims and whether they work or don't work is an issue. But just to give you a background and perspective in this realm. <clears throat> so what are the challenges? Lack of scientific evidence concerning safety and efficacy, research methodology, traditional medicine with a holistic view we need to look at. Each different system has its own theory. That's a pain. That's a, it's such a hard thing to grasp. It's a lack of international standards and when we deal with this. And as such, there has been general guidelines that have dealt, developed with the World Health Organization to look at methodologies of research and evaluation of traditional medicine. Looking at the, in the last few minutes, there is some real research going out, for example, Mount Sinai, where they have the MSSM, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Formulation 12, that was reformulated to 2. And it had an effect on IL-4, gamma interferon, IL-5, it's made up of these Chinese herbals by under Dr. Zoom and Lee uh, at the uh, her center there in Mount Sinai, New York City. And it clearly had an effect in animal models, and it's already in clinical studies. In animal models, it showed that this formulation does not cause apoptosis. It decreases mucus production, goblet hyperplasia. If you look at the upper right-hand corner, it's amazing. No treatment is plugged treatment, which is B and C, are equivalent. Uh, C is dexamethsteroids, dex. B is the uh, herbal formulation, and D is, you know, just plain naive, which is untreated. And they found these varieties bands, which I'm going to 
pass quickly. And they've also looked at peanut for, uh, uh, formulation, this a food allergy herbal for epid, which you can be in the literature, and its effect on cytokines. Interesting enough, that not just the cytokines, but it actually changes the numbers of interbarns gamma secreting CD8 cells, again published in 2007 as a potential of this item. Adverse effects are very important. And for example here, when you talk about St. John's wort, which is commonly was used out there as a fat in HIV patients, it had an effect on HIV protease inhibitors, adenovir. If you took St. John's wort, it lowered the adenovir uh, level, so to a level that may have caused proliferation of, quote unquote, the HIV virus, and therefore the HIV threshold was not reached uh, with the therapeutic, same therapeutic drug. But it also has effect on a variety of other drugs, fexofenadine, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, theophylin, oral contraceptives. So you have to understand the St. John's work or a variety of these compounds have a drug-induced ability. It induces the liver to metabolize many some of, uh, some of these products, and there are studies looking at a variety of, uh, of these. Chicken soup, I would like to end or come to a conclusion of, is that whether it doesn't really work, and here's a special report done by Steve Reinard, published in Chess 2000, and it was a, he was at the NIH with me when I was there. And when he did different alloc plots of chicken soup, starch with chicken, add vegetables, matzo ball, preps, and he looked at chemotaxis of cells and from the uh, eluates. And sure enough, the different eluates uh, were, did have different effects. Uh, so the question, the statement is that your grandmother, your Bubby, was right that perhaps chicken soup does have an anti-inflammatory effect. But other examples of CAM use in allergy, probiotics, I'll mention that Culturel DSL number three is the only one that has active, uh, and it's approved by the FDA for use in inflammatory bowel disease, and it actually has live cultures. All the others that they buy over the counter, most of them are dead. So you're wasting money if you're really looking to use probiotics. So people always ask me, which one do you, can you use? Well, Culturel is an example of an FDA-approved probiotic. Again, I'm speaking, uh, this is the ones that are available. Uh, there's no other one that I know of. If there is, I'd love, love to know about it, but I, as far as I know, this is it. Nasal lavage has been in the past what we always done, but before there were nasal steroids. I mean, the people use nasal saline. That's now become complementary, meaning it's some form it's being used. Nasal solutions such as sinusol is starting to come out. There are other ones with capsaicin. Uh, sinus busters, I think, is with capsaicin, which does have, have an effect. Um, sinusol is made with menthol, eucalyptus, and mint. So it has, we mentioned the mint and the, the ability to uh, stabilize mast cells. And the, uh, there's a homeopathic remedy such as rhinitis, nasalis, which is basically a powder barrier that has a, a homeopathic agent in it. But I, they're starting to look at one, the exact same product without the uh, agents to see if it is uh, a potential used as a powder to obstruct, to cover the surface. Uh, conjunctivitis, similisan contains belladonna, and that's the important feature here. I want you to, when you ask your patients about CAM use, you need to speak to them. Because, like, similisan is an, is an ocular homeopathic uh, treatment, but it contains belladonna, and it can cause dryness of the eye. So it will actually aggravate it in some patients. Um, and again, herbs, echinacea, we mentioned. What are the liability? The component here is that uh, it is a diet and exercise has been universal. Liabilities, recommendations to use, again, support. There are different issues of knowing what has support, what doesn't. And this is an article from Eisberg in 2002 where you need, in, you know, where you have evidence indicates serious risk. What are your liabilities when you don't provide recommendations to use or not to use? Whether it's, it's a question. And this is our liability issue. You just have to become more knowledgeable. You should be open-minded about it. So a historical overview. In 2000 BC, here, eat this root. 1000 CE, root was heathen. Say the prayer. 1850, the prayer of superstition. Drink the potion. 1940, potion of snake oil. Swallow the pill. That pill is ineffective, take the antibiotic, and now the antibiotic is artificial, smoke this leaf. We just remember that, in my conclusion, the plural of anecdote is not evidence. And as such, you have to keep a good open mind and thinking about what we're doing. Thank you. Great, here we go.
Good morning. Very good. So, any comments or questions from the uh, group uh, about this? Uh, I'll be on the Dr. Billery, I had a patient ask and thought on your list about bee pollen for allergies. Have you seen any data on that? Yeah, data is, speaks against it because bee pollen is literally where the pollen is from. It's basically an oral desensitization, and bees have about 100 yards of radius for where they transport their or use their bee honey. There's bee pollen, there's uh, honey. Uh, but the problem is that it can, it can be adverse as well as positive. So there's, the data is not supported. Okay, that's kind of what I thought. Thanks. Well, also, bees would collect the pollen from flowers, which usually aren't aeroallergens, so they wouldn't collect it from weeds and trees and stuff that would get in the air. Yeah, they, they, can, also, they can also collect it from poison ivy. Meaning, oh, uh, and they can also collect it from, uh, that's why they have it, beehives in pear tree, you know, uh, in pears or <laughs> apple orchards or something like that. So they're very specific, they can have apple hunt. Uh, Brock, you had a comment? Yeah, we, we actually examined uh, bee pollen and uh, because we had a lady that had gastritis was putting on her cereal every morning and it was mostly ragweed. And if yeah. I was a bee, you could really load up, you know, fast from ragweed. Anyway, my, um, my question is, you always see this stuff that uh, advertised as strengthening the immune system. Uh, and, and you see that, that seems to be the most, one of the most popular phrases. What can you do about that? I mean, I, that's, uh, there might be immunological changes in vitro. Uh, I doubt if there's any in vivo, but uh, it, it just seems to me, it, you know, if you're trying to change someone's belief system, that we don't have much material to do that with on, on statements like that. You're correct. Uh, I mean, when you say boosting the immune system, there's nothing you can do about that, but they're not making any specific uh, claims or making a non-specific uh, uh, claim. So therefore, it is something that they can say, uh, mm -hmm. and it's based upon limited data. But you, but you have to just keep an open mind, saying that there's limited data. Uh, it's done in mice. It's done in vitro. Uh, it's clinical studies or not. But it's more important to know about what are the adverse effects of those agents because those will scare them just as much to take the routine drugs, which also have adverse effects. But it's important. The adverse effect component is probably more important when it comes to those. And like, you know, probiotics is that uh, which ones and uh, are there harmful ones? There's been a probiotic uh, infectious process that has been reported when people don't properly take. There's camillasan, which is a chamomile base, which causes anaphylaxis, like you, you said that uh, mm -hmm. person with a stomach problem with uh, ragweed. But there, there are issues, and people need to know about the adverse effects more so. And as you said, all drugs have potential side effects. I guess better the side effects you know about than the ones you don't. That is not about. In terms of boosting immune system, that is the most popular claim, and that sort of implies that somebody's immune system was weak to begin with doesn't specify what part of the immune system having, you know, spending a lot of time on immunology, it's a very complex system, so what, what is it actually boosting? And if you boost it too much, you get autoimmunity, which could be harmful, so it's, it's really a happy medium, and obviously there's a lot of problems with claims of that nature. Uh, we're going to we're gonna have to stop there. I'd like to thank Dr. Billery, uh, uh, Dr. Leonard Billery from uh, uh, Rutgers University in uh, uh, New Jersey for uh, giving this presentation on complementary and alternative medicine. Um, join us on Friday. We're going to have a patient management conference. Next Monday, we're not going to have a conference. It's Memorial Day. Uh, we've all decided we're going to go home, stay home, and not have a conference. So awesome. Have a great weekend. All right, bye. Sign have on. a great week, everyone. And uh, thanks, Len, and uh, we'll see you next time. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences online allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.